thank you for this day. We'll tell you thank you for the prayers that have already been played and prayed in this place. We ask now that you would incline your ear to, to those prayers, oh God. Lord, I pray now, oh God, as we go into this final study, oh God, I ask again a blessing upon these who are in this place right now, God. Lord, would you bless these who are here? Would you bless their families, oh God? Would you bless their children now, Father? Would you bless their homes and their relationships, oh God? Would you bless their businesses and their jobs and careers, oh God? Would you bless them in their going out and their coming in? Their early rising and their downsetting? Bless them in the city and in the field, Lord. Lord God, that we may be witnesses for you, oh God. That we may be testimonies of your goodness and your faithfulness, oh God. I tell you, thank you for these. And as, as we go into this prayer meeting, oh God, and as we go and leave this prayer meeting and go into this Bible study, oh God, Lord, bless us, oh God, that our time will be fruitful together, that we will not only be hearers of your word, but that we may be doers also. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. All my heavenly Father's children say amen. 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 So, family, I'm going to share a few things with you before we get started. Um, in our noonday Bible study, we've been going through a series of Christianity versus other religions, right? And so we finished that series of studies. This we, we finished that series of studies today. When we finished looking at the other religions as opposed to Christianity on today. Um, but beginning on next week, we're going to continue the series by simply looking at the foundations of Christianity. Amen. So at, we we discussed what other religions were all about, and we discussed those as opposed to. Uh, Christian, as opposed to Christianity. But on next week, starting next week for a few weeks, we're going to be looking at the foundations of Christianity. Amen? And our noonday Bible study. So we're going to be looking at uh, what does it mean to be uh, a Christian, where we get our scriptures from, justification, sanctification, all of those different things. So we're going to spend the rest of the month uh, on the foundations of Christianity at our noonday study. Amen? But I want to share, I want to share a usable, <coughs> uh, usable illustration with you. I want you to take this uh, take this illustration and remember it. Okay? I want you to remember it because that's something that all of us we do we see every day that we take for granted that I don't, I believe uh, really should strengthen our faith. So let me share that with you. If I was to blindfold you, listen to me. If I was to blindfold you right now, I put a blindfold on you, and I had a bag of ping pong balls. Say there's thirty ping pong balls inside the bag, and there's one red ping pong ball and all the rest of them are white, right? Listen to me. What are the chances that you reach into that bag and pull out the red ping pong ball the first time? Right? Okay. So let's say we duplicated that experiment 30 times, right? What is the chances that every single time you go into that bag and pull out the red, that, that you're going to go in that bag and pull out the red ping pong ball? It's almost, it's almost impossible, right? Now, say hypothetically, Sister McKinney did that. Every time she went to bed, she pulled out the red ping pong ball. 30 times, blindfolded, what would you say? You say something else is up, right? You say something else is up, right? When you say that, you're like, come on now, you got a magnet on your finger, what's going on? Something's up, right? Okay, so let me give you another illustration. Same illustration, just in a, maybe a, a more practical way. Uh, for those of you who go to the casino. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But, but listen, if you're playing poker, right, and, and every time the cards were dealt, the person that you're, that you're playing with had a, what do you call it, a, a full house or a royal flush or something, every single time they got their cards, they had a royal flush. Right? They win, play another game, royal flush. Exact same cards every single time. What would you say? Somebody cheated, right? Somebody messing with the cards, right? Now listen, I want to say to you that that illustration, both of those illustrations that I just gave you, happens to every one of us every single day. And we don't even realize it. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you wake up every day and the sun, and, and you see the sun shining? The night falls. The sun goes away every single day. Certain months, there is there is winter, 
There is summer, there is spring, irrespective of how uh, summer, our winter is, it's still winter, right? The seasons still change every year, right? We, 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 we wake up and, we, and there are some things, right? Some of you all came in here, uh, or some of you all, and you'll see a ball over, and you just expect it to come down. You don't ever ask yourself, I wonder if the law of gravity is going to work this time. <coughs> Do you? No, you just expect it to work. Every single time. Now, how? Now, if you think about the details of that, how how random is that? Or is it the case that somebody has got got to be messing with the cards? Somebody has got to be controlling this thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's impossible for every single day. If what those who don't believe in God say that it's just random. If it's just random, if it's just evolution, if it's just a random fortuitous happenings, if that's the case, then it wouldn't be the same every day. Do you understand what I'm saying? You cannot get order from chaos. Everybody understand that? So I want you all to remember that. Share those illustrations as you give a chance. That's, that's proof that there'll be a God somewhere because the days, there is too much order in this universe. The universe is too finely tuned for human, for human life. Amen? It's, it's, it's almost as though you were expecting a baby and you built a, a designed a room for that baby to go to. So when that baby came into that room, he had, that child had everything that they needed. That's what we experience when we see the earth. That the earth has been prepared. Everybody understand that? So I just wanted to share that with you. Amen? So on tonight we're going to continue our verse by verse study in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 25. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through um, 25. Right, so we saw on last week that uh, Philip, he went to uh, Samaria, and we saw that as they were trying to persecute the church, that actually, uh, behind the scenes, they were actually fulfilling God's plan, right? And that they could not stop God's plan. Now, on this week, we're going to be looking at a man named Simon, Simon the Sorcerer, amen? And I hope to show you on tonight the root of many of the things that we see practiced today, that the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And we're going to see where this actually got its call, uh, it's called that, and it's with this man named Simon. So we're going to surround our time together around this. You know, I thought it was cute to say Simon says, amen. But we're going to talk about this guy, Simon, the sorcerer, amen. So tonight we discover how it's possible to confess with your mouth and not believe in your heart. Yeah. Simon's false confession is seen today. In fact, I was talking to our dear brother um, earlier today, Will, and we were talking about this very thing, easy believism. Right? We were talking about the fact how so many people just say things with their mouth. But just because you say with your mouth you believe in Jesus, don't necessarily mean that you're saved. Amen? Because there is something that ought to, that, that ought to happen in your life. Amen? If, if, if it's real, if it's true. In fact, Jesus testifies of these very things. What does Jesus say? There are many who say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. Amen? I never knew you. And so we want to see about that tonight. So let's dig in. Somebody say, let's dig in. So we're going to read, I'm going to read these verses to you, and then we'll go through our outline. Here's the, all right, so a man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years. Where is there? In Samaria, right? He was a sorcerer, meaning what? He practiced black magic. He, play, he practiced uh, um, trickery, chicanery, sleight of hand, all of these different things. And he was also using the power of the demonic to do miracles or do uh, great signs. Amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. You see that? The great one, the power of God. What that really means is, what that saying is, that, that he was actually one of, uh, Justin Martyr, who was alive at the same time as one of the early church fathers. His name is Justin Martyr. He has a lot of work, a lot of material you can look up online, you can get from the library. But he wrote about this guy, Simon, and he said what, what he was professing himself to be was to be some kind of incarnation of God. Okay, so to, to become some kind of uh, power of God that was manifested on earth, that God could, was able to manifest himself in different ways, and he manifested himself as him. So this is what he was saying about himself, and the people believed him, all right? They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded him with his what? With his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus uh, Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. So now, allow me to show, to show you something to contrast real quick. Now, here it says that they, that they uh, 
when, when Simon was, was talking or doing whatever he was, claiming to be somebody great, he was talking about himself and he was doing miracles, right? And they believed him. But now when Philip came, what was the difference between what Philip did and what Simon did? Because the Bible says that Philip was doing miracles as well. So what was the difference between Simon and Philip? Philip was doing it in the name of Jesus. He wasn't talking about, hey man, look how great I am. Right? He wasn't doing that. What he was doing was talking about, no, let me tell you how great the God is that, 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 that allows me to do this. The God that's doing this through me, right? So what is the lesson, that we, the practical lesson that we learned from that? We'll dig deeper in that in a moment. But the practical lesson that we learned from that is we always want to give glory to God. Amen? As believers of Jesus Christ, we give glory to God. We tell God, thank you for whatever gifts, whatever talents we have. We don't, uh, we're going to talk about this more in a moment, but we don't walk around looking down on ourselves, talking about I'm nothing. Because the Bible doesn't even tell you to do that, right? The Bible tells you to think soberly of yourself, right? But we give glory to God because we would have nothing if it was not for his gifts, amen? All right, so Philip was turning the, the people's attention to God, right? And uh, Philip's message of the good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. You see that? Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. So that this is simply saying there's many people who believe and are baptized, but none of that saves you. Right? The Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. You can say whatever you want to say with your lips. Right? How many of you have had, I, I mean, now, I don't know about you, but I know I know many people who have had an emotional experience, but that experience with no further than their emotions. Amen? It's not about emotionalism, it's about heart change. Amen? And that's what that's what believing in Jesus Christ is all about. You tell me something, listen to me. You tell me one thing that you believe with your, in your heart that doesn't change the way you change something about your life. Just one, one thing. You ever been around somebody who, who you knew didn't like you? They never said they didn't like you. But you knew they didn't like you, why? Because somehow, some way it came out. Isn't that right? If I, walked, if I told you I love my wife, but I was beating on her, treating her any kind of way, cheating on her, all kind of things like that, you'd be like, I hear what you're saying with your mouth. What would you say? But you don't really believe that in your heart. If it's in your heart, and, and listen, this doesn't mean you're perfect. This doesn't mean that we're perfect. Y'all hear me what I'm saying? Let, let us not uh, come under the guide that we as Christians are perfect. That's not what that means. But what it means is, if I'm straying down the wrong path, something's going to pull me back in another way. I can't stay there. The Bible teaches the preservation. This is one of the doctrines of the church. The preservation of, of, of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. Amen? What does that mean? It means we may stray at times, but we will come back. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit within us. Everybody receive that? All right. And so then, uh, watch this. Uh, he began following uh, Philip wherever he went. He was amazed by the signs and the great miracles Philip did. So what happened with him? He got caught up in what? He got caught up in what he was seeing. He got caught up in the, in, in the performance, in the miracles. Family, we want something wanting to be powerful. We want our father to sing as powerful as we want him to be. We want him to, the prayer to be powerful, the sermon to be powerful. But don't you get caught up in the moment and forget, and, and forget who, who, who the moment is about. Amen? Don't, get, don't just hear the voices of the choir and not hear the message of the song. Right? Don't get caught up in the presentation of a sermon and, and, and start thinking, I like the way I like the way Reverend Smith preached and not the way this one preached. It ain't about the presentation of the, of, the, of the message. It's about what? The message itself. Amen? So what we do, you say, you, you, you ought to love the way Pastor Kemp preaches it and presents it, and you ought to love the way Reverend Smith pre preaches it and presents it, and you ought to love the way Reverend DeVille preaches it and presents it. Why? Because all of us are different. Yeah, you know, yeah, I saw Reverend, Reverend DeVille on Sunday. Boy, let me see something. Reverend DeVille has his head down like this. Yeah, I'm going to tell you why he does it because he's nervous. I'm just telling you. He has his head down like this. But boy, when that boy raises his head up, y'all, <laughs> Lord have mercy, he's hungry. He raises his head up and starts, and starts saying, talking about his grandfather, I was like, Lord have mercy. The nerves went away, didn't they? <laughs> my, my, my. And so it's not, it's not about the presentation. Thank God for, for, for whatever presentation or gifts, abilities, and methods that he gives us. But it's ultimately about what? The message of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when the apostles in Jerusalem um, it, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John out of bed. So I want you all to hear this. As a Christian, we don't shy away from the tough parts of Scripture. And here's one of those tough places of Scripture that we have to explain to you, but I want you to get it because this ought to disturb your spirit when you read 
when we get ready to read. As soon as they arrive, they pray for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Right? That's, that's, what's up with that? Right? We want, but I don't, I'm, we're going to explain it to you. You probably already looked at your notes. But don't look at your notes yet. We're going to, I want to really deal, deal with that and teach that to you what that means. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus the Lord. Then Peter, now I'm telling you, those two verses have presented so much false doctrine yeah. and it, since, since, since this. People have built, again, their foundations upon something that's not supposed to be a description. It's meant to be a, a description. It's describing the details of what happened historically. And this is not a doctrinal book. So this is not a book that for us to build our doctrine upon. This is teaching you what happened in history. Amen? And so then if you take it as a doctrinal statement, then you start to build foundations upon that. And now you've got what? you got the teachings of second baptism. you got the teachings of, 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 of apostles laying their hands on people and people start falling out speaking in tongues and all this other stuff. Right? you got the teachings of confirmation. That's where this came from. This is where the, the teaching of confirmation in the Catholic Church, this is where it comes from right here. This is the reason why uh, the, the, you know, the, a, 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 a person going to confirmation after it's all over with the, the uh, bishop or whatever, or whatever, whoever the person, the priest or whatever, will lay his hands on that person. Right? That's what this is all about. It came from right here. It is a false teaching based upon a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of this text. Right? So um, we, we want to put the text in its context and, and understand what it means. Why? Because a text without context is what? A come. Amen. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. This is, um, this is what we see practice today. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Like, damn, let me get some of that, bro. That's literally what he said. Let me have this power too, he explained, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Right? You see that? But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this. Why? Because your heart is not right with God. It shows you that when at first when he said he believed, it was only a lip service. It was only it was nothing that really came to his heart because Peter not here declared, your heart is not right. And that's the problem. And the question is not, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? The question is, do you believe it in your heart? Because if you believe it in your heart, it will affect the way you live your life. Repent of your wickedness. What does it mean to repent? It doesn't mean to feel sorry. It doesn't mean to have remorse. Because that's what he's getting ready to have. But repent is not about remorse. Repent means to change your mind. Repent means to see things the way God sees them. Right? So think about this. If I felt about my sin the way God felt about my sin, how would I treat my sin? See what I'm saying? That's what the word repent means. It means to have a change of heart, a change of mind. That's the reason why the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Repent of your, of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy. What was, motiv what was motivating him? He was jealous. He wanted, he wanted the power that they had. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be what they had. And, and, and held captive by sin. You are, you are held captive by sin and family. This is the state of every person that is outside of Christ Jesus. You are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon is blind. That these terrible things you said won't happen to me. What is that? That's remorse. It's not a change of heart. It's remorse. I, I, I just don't want. I don't want you. I don't want those terrible things you said to be happening. But it never says that he says, I'm, I, "I was wrong. I, I see the error of my ways." Right now, history tells us about this man Simon. Seriously, that there's a lot of written about this man Simon that he goes on to become one, a, a great false prophet. That there, there, is, there was even a statue built to this man in Rome, according to Justin Martyr, a statue built of this man in Rome, calling him the great power of God. He never repented. That close to, 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 to God, that close to the move of the Holy Spirit, but never changed. How many of us are like that? How many times have we come around people that say, I mean, I, I hear it all the time, I was raised in the church, bro, I was raised, you know, mama was this, dad was this, uncle was this, none of that matters. Because you can't get in, in, into heaven based on relationship. You can't get into heaven based on proximity to God. You got to get into heaven based upon relationship.
relationship with God. Personal relationship with God. Right? People say this all the time, that there are many ways to get to God. But actually, the truth of the matter is, and we've, I've seen this throughout the, these several weeks of studying the, the, the different world religions, is that actually that no religion tells you the way to God. No religion leads you on a path to get to God. Not even one of them. Not one. And not even Christianity. Christianity doesn't tell you the way to get to God. Christianity tells you that, that, you have to, that Jesus is the way. It doesn't lead you on a path. It leads you to a person. Amen? And it is the only one. No other world religion says you have to, this is the path to get to God. Islam says that you can't have a relationship with God because he is an impersonal God. He's angry at humanity. And even if you lived, even if you did everything right and stood before, stood before Allah, Islam says in the Quran that he still can tip the scales. That's literally what it says. Only Christianity says that you can have a personal relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. It doesn't lead you down a way. It leads you to a person. And my question is, have you found the person? Right? Because if you're looking for a way, then guess what? You're going to be just like Simon. You're going to be saying certain things. You're going to be talking the right thing. You ever see somebody like that? They can say all the right things for a little while. They can do the right things for a little while. But if it ain't in their heart, if they haven't met the person, then they're just on a, a false path. Sooner or later, they're going to turn their back on it all. But you can, on, with that same thing, you can see people who, who, who've been in church, they live in church, they go through some storms, they weather some storms, but guess what? They're still here. Backslide, make a mistake, but guess what? They're still there. Why? Because it's in the heart. The heart has been changed. They have met the person of Jesus Christ. And this is the reason why, and I'm, I'm going to say this in, I'm gonna say this deeper in a minute, but, but I said this on last week and I want to say it again. This is the reason why we've got to stop. Believers, listen to me. We've got to use biblical language. Right? I, I know that we have to, we have to, uh, how do you do that? You've got to put it where, where, where people can reach it. You know, you have to do that, but at the same time, we have to use the language of Scripture. So that we don't water down what the word actually means. And so as Baptists, we, we, we try to water that thing down a little bit and we use words like this. Once saved, always saved. Right? And, 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 and it's true. Right? The, the foundation of what it means is true. But the problem is, because it's such watered down language, that we start thinking, that people start thinking they can come to church, but say, say I believe in Jesus Christ, and then live any kind of way. Because it sounds, better it sound cheap. Once saved, always saved. It sounds like I can just, I, all I got to do is say, Lord, I believe in you, now I'm good, and I can go back chill, and, and chill, do what I want to do. Right? But what is the language of Scripture? The language of Scripture is eternal security. Say it, somebody say it with me, eternal security. Now, what is that based upon? Now, listen, now, now tell me how much, it's the same thing, but tell me how much more different does the actual words of Scripture sound versus this watered-down cheap. Language that we use, once saved, always saved. Now take this, eternal security, based upon what? The words of Jesus Christ that says this, watch. Them who I hold in my hand, not even the devil in hell can pluck him out. Now see, it's the same thing, but they sound totally different, don't they? One is watered down, but one says this. One says, you need Jesus to be saved, you need Jesus to stay saved, and you need Jesus even when you even to get to heaven. That there is no part of your life that Jesus is not holding you in that moment. Do you understand that? So guess what? If you believe that Jesus is holding you even now, I've given my life to Jesus, but he's still holding me in his hand. Think about how, how much different you think about it than, rather than hearing one say, always say. That right now, I'm going through whatever I'm going through. Temptation, he's holding me. Sickness, he's holding me. Relationship problems, he's holding me. Financial job, all of them, he's holding me, right? See, my, I feel totally different about Jesus than just saying, one save, always save. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's, let's, let's get in the habit of using the language of Scripture, family. And so after testifying and preaching the word of the, of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem and stopped in, Samar in the Samaritan uh, villages along the way to preach the good news. So let's, let's, let, let's dig into our outline. So first of all, here, here, here's the problems that we see with Simon. The first thing is we see Simon's view of self. You want to see that? 
Simon's view of self, verses uh, verses nine through eleven. Simon's view, Simon's view of self. Listen to what it says. It says a man named Simon had been in a, a social level for many years, amazing the people of Samaria. And what was he doing? Claiming to be someone great. He claimed. Now, what does that mean? Anybody? What does it mean? He claimed to be someone great. This is this is what he was saying about himself. Is what it means. What it means was he was he was walking around talking about some man. Do you know who I'm talking to? Who you talking to? You know who you looking at? Yeah, he, he was walking around always talking about himself. So that's what it means. He was claiming to be someone great. So in order to just dig into that a little bit uh, deeper, here's some questions that we want. I want to ask us. Number one, is it wrong to desire to be great? Okay. So so somebody help me. But what? Is, how, how do you? How, as a Christian, how do we look at that? Is, is it wrong to desire to be great? We say no, but I need more than just a yes or no answer. Somebody give me some context. Put some meat on that bone for me. Come on, man. Come on, man. I was wondering if somebody was going to see that. Come on. Did y'all hear that? So over and over again, his disciples, and actually on three different occasions, the disciples came to Jesus and, 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 and uh, you know, asked about who's the greatest in, among the king. Now here's what I want you to notice. Jesus never rebuked him. You hear me? He never rebuked him. The disciples got mad, but Jesus never rebuked him. But he, what he did was he, he did correct their view of it, of what greatness is. And that's the, that, that's, the, that's the point. The point is, what is your view of what greatness is? Greatness is everybody calling your name, and you got a, uh, you have a non-Christian view of what greatness is. Jesus says the greatest is about is those who become your what? Your servant. So what that really says to me, in a very practical sense, family, what that really says to me is that greatness is about you know the, your craft, the, the, being the best in, in your craft, in your field, being the best in the in, in your area of gifting. It's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong, wrong with wanting to be the best that you can be. Uh, Dr. Jackson, who was what was uh, first of all, what's his name? Uh, the failure. It, that, that's what he said. He said he went to school one year, and, and the first year that he went to school as a, as a teacher, you know, he, he, he said it was like the worst year ever of teaching. But then he said that he, you know, he took some time off. But then in that, in that that second year of his teaching, he said the difference was that summer. He said, I want to be the best teacher that I'm gonna be. I want to be the best teacher that I can be. You see, that, that's the difference, family. The difference is it, it is it's not about trying to make your name great, but trying to be. Be, be great at what God has called you to do and what God has given you to do. In fact, this is what God says to Abraham. God says to Abraham, and there was a moment where Abraham would have compromised in order to receive great material blessing, great material wealth. He could compromise. But here's what God said. God, God says to him, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you worry about being great at what God calls you to do, be the best servant in whatever area God has gifted you in or whatever area you're, you're working in, let God deal with your name. Amen? All right. And so and so, and so, then he will make our name great. Now watch this. The, the next question is, so what is, how, how then should a Christian view themselves? I want to make sure that we get this straight. And I, and I said this before and I want to make sure I say it again. Uh, we sing this song that says, you know, uh, for such a worm as I Something like that, right? Such a such a worm as I. And I want to make sure that we understand that, that in the right context. Okay? I, when, when Isaiah says, Woe, uh, woe is woe unto me, uh, I am a man of unclean lips, you know, I dwell among the people of unclean lips. Uh, you know, when, when the Bible says my righteousness is no more than filthy rags in the eyesight of God, you know, and what that's talking about is a leper who is scraping all that pulse and stuff off his skin. And he's trying to clean his skin. That's what that's talking about. That, that rag that he throws away. It's, but that's talking about before Christ. Family. You understand what I'm saying? It's talking about before Christ. So as a Christian, you are in Christ. And God don't look at you as such a worm as I. And you shouldn't look at yourself like that. And I'm going to tell you furthermore that we ought to very, be very careful in contextualizing such a worm as I. Amen? Because there's even a lot of things that the Bible says about us before even becoming saved to how God feels about us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? Do you all understand that?
So, 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 so now, my dear brother, uh, I say my dear brother like I know him, this dude, one of the church fathers, his name is Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, right? I mean, he has this, this great, great book about Christianity, right? But I've been reading, I've been reading church history, but I've, I've been reading my first time since that. I got this, this pop powerful book called The Incomparable Christ. And I, I, I love reading God. Just, that's what God's reading right now, The Incomparable Christ. And it's talking about the way Christ has been presented throughout the years. Thomas Aquinas, though, he has this issue with, with thinking that he has to go through monasteries. He has to go through self, all of this uh, grave self-denial in order to be right with Christ. That he has to forsake the world and be in isolation, only reading the scriptures. See, that's foreign from scriptures. That's foreign from scriptures, family. God tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. That's not about dealing with your with, with your friends. I was telling some, telling a group last week that, that that means that doesn't mean that when you become saved, you gotta stop being friends with every unsaved person that you have. That that's not that's not scripture. But that was Thomas Aquinas' view of scripture. Amen. What the Bible tells us is to engage the world. That you can have good friendships with somebody who ain't saved, but at the same time, they ought to be they ought to be sharpened by the fact that you are saved. They ought to be able to see how, how if you're not engaged with the world, is the world going to see the good works that you are doing and then be, and then see the Father who will say. So how do we view ourselves, family? I want you all to look at those scriptures there. I put you, I put you three scriptures there. So many more. And if you want to hand out, I can give you. Here's a handout on how we should view ourselves. You know, the, the, uh, 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 number one, in, in, a, in a humble way, Right? That we should be humble and not full of pride. The Bible tells us to think soberly about ourselves. But Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 27 tells us we're made in the image of God. That means we have value, worth, dignity. Right? Psalms 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? It goes so far as to compare, God compares like, like the oceans to, to us, to, to his creation. Talk about how much more beautiful we are than all of, the, all of uh, his uh, other creation. He made us a little lower than the angels. Amen? So, and then he calls us this. How, how should we view ourselves? The Bible calls us, listen to the language of Scripture. He says we are a city on a hill. Right? The light of the world. The salt of the earth. Right? We, the Bible calls us that we're friends of God. And here's what I want to say to you, family. I want to say to you two chapters that I want you to refresh yourself on. And if you want to think about how Christians should view themselves, two chapters I want you to refresh yourself on. We went through it on, on uh, last year, but I want you to refresh yourself on it. Romans chapter 7. And too many of us are living in Romans chapter 7 when it comes to our view of ourselves. That, that, that's that's pre-Christ, but what you, how you should view yourself is Romans chapter 8. That nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Amen? So we have a sober view of ourselves. I'm, I'm imperfect. You know, I don't, I don't look down on others, but at the same time, I don't have no view of myself like I'm nothing. Like, you know, how, how your pastor had that, I tell you all the time, I had that, that false humility. When somebody said, you did such a good job, I'd be like, thank you. That's, that's a false humility, because the truth back of the matter is, it's something, it's, it's, we all need encouragement. So if somebody tells you, you've done a good job, don't walk away from that encouragement and say, Lord, thank you for the encouragement. Right? Because I don't know about you, but I'm going to be honest with you, family. I, I got a bad habit. I'm, I'm just being transparent with myself. I got a bad habit I'm asking God to take from me. And my bad habit is, I, I, will, I will focus more on the one negative thing that somebody says to me than the millions of people who give me encouragement. I, I'll be at church on Sunday, and, and, and y'all be like, Pastor, you did a good job. Thank you. You really helped me. And then I'll be walking to my office, and one person says something negative to me. Like, why you had that on? And I'd be like, well, I'm telling you, ask my wife. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. No, what do you mean? Like, you're not talking about that. No, I'm not talking about that. I, you know, I was talking about my little disco shirt on I had on Sunday. Like, yeah. <laughs> God told me to put that back in the back of the closet. <laughs> no, 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 we're talking about that. No, we're talking about that. I, I was being hypothetical in what I was saying. I promise. I promise I wouldn't even do that. I'm not going to get down like that. But what I am saying, family, what I am saying, though, is I'm just being hypothetical, right? <laughs> I understand why you think what you think. I thought my shirt was nice, bro. I don't know. I was walking in church pretty toes like this. I was like, And God said, like, you know what, man? I don't know about that shirt, though. <laughs> You be doing all right, but today you missed it. <laughs> but I was being hypothetical. Seriously, I was being hypothetical. But what I'm saying is, back to let me try to get back style, get back in the moment. What I was trying to say is this: I, I have a tendency to do that. I have a tendency to focus upon the 
negative things that are said about me versus taking receiving the encouragement of positive things. Now watch this. So if I if I never come to the understanding of what being humble really is, if I never come to that understanding, then I'm gonna miss out on all the moments that God is trying to encourage me. Right through 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 people. I'll miss out on that and I walk around defeated all the time. Right? But I'm telling you, I don't know how many of you live there, but, I, but because I strive to do to be the best that I can be, I want to be the best preacher, pastor, husband, father, that man that I can be. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I really, really do. Right? But, but when I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm usually focused on myself. And sometimes I take it overboard. My wife always telling me, bro, come on now. If, if I mispronounce a word, I'd be like, bro, I can't believe I am not to pronounce that word. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And so then we have to learn how to receive encouragement in a healthy, in a healthy perspective. All right? Simon's view. I know I got uh, seven minutes left, but I'm about to knock this thing out in seven minutes. Watch. Uh, Simon's view of salvation. Here's the point. This is the one that I really want you to see. Simon's view of salvation. I really, really want you to remember this. Okay? Verses 12 through 17. But now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed uh, by the signs and the great miracles of Philip. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted the message, they sent Peter and John there as soon as they arrived. Now, I want to say, first of all, that he was not really saved. That's the first thing. That's the first thing I want you to see. He was not really saved. And, that's, and, and the Bible says, Peter says, his heart was not right. Second heading, on, 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 second heading part B on the, the number two, what does it say? Is this saint in the church today? Yes. How, how many times? I, I don't know about you, but I'm saying uh, so many times in the church, you see people, they come to the altar, they give their life to God, they, they talk about how, you know, uh, but you never see him again. Let me tell you, this guy, Rick, I want y'all to know that Rick, you know, as soon as he joined this church, was baptized and all that, his job transferred. That's why he hadn't seen him. Okay, so I want you to think, all right? Uh, his job transferred him to Corpus Christi, so that's where he's at, all right? Now, um, so this is saying today, if there are many who can, who can, who can, Say that they all the right things, but if it's not in your heart, it's not real thing. Okay? And, and that is something not for you. It's not. Listen to me again. It ain't your job to determine who's saved and who ain't saved. Alright? None of us walk around and say they ain't saved. No, that ain't your job. That ain't your job. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. I, I'll tell you something else. Most of the folks that you see come to the altar, if, they, if, they, if they're really saved, they would probably say before they ever got down to the altar. Probably was when they said, you know, I need to go, I need to step out of here. At that moment, God probably, they were probably say. And there's many folks who may, who may get saved after the message is over with. Right? So every moment of salvation don't happen at the altar. So, so none of us can say who's saved and who's not. Right? What is it? What is the point of this? It is a personal heart test. You test your own heart. The Bible says, if you judge yourself, you will have no reason to be judged. All right? Now watch this. Here's the point. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. What's up with this, y'all? What's up with this? I thought that the moment that we give our life to Christ, the whole, we, we receive the Holy Spirit simultaneously. Is that right or is that wrong? So, so what's up with this? The Bible says that they are saved, they believe in Jesus Christ, they're baptized, but they have not received the Holy Spirit. Okay, here it is. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus, this is the great profession. The great profession where Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Peter says, uh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. What does Jesus say in return? Jesus says, you, my Father in heaven revealed this unto you. But then he goes on to say this. He goes on to say, and I shall give you the keys of the kingdom. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Do you, do you all understand that? Now I know that we don't read that in context. We have no idea what that means. But Jesus gave the keys to the apostles. Do you all understand that? Now, what that meant was that in, when, whenever Jesus said in, 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 in Acts chapter uh, 1 and verse 8, I believe it was, that you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. He was talking to who? The apostles. Right? And so the keys to open up salvation to all of these doors was from the, through the apostles. And once the apostles it went through the apostles, then it was opened up to the world. Do you all understand that? Uh, again, you're going to see the same thing happening on the day of Pentecost. You're going to see in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, 3 through 17, and again on Acts chapter 10. Peter, the one who God gave the, key, gave the keys to, was instrumental in opening up those doors. Do you all understand that? And not 
until Peter is there will God give confirmation to him. Now let's think about that for a moment. Why? A text without a context is a comma. Again, we put it in context, it doesn't just mean reading all the text, it also means put it in, in its historical cultural context. So now you have the Samaritans and the Jews. What is the problem here? They don't get along. Isn't that right? Yeah. You, you, all you got to do is read a few pages in, in, in the Gospels. The Samaritans and Jews don't get along. So now what happens? If now this Judean man comes and he prays for them and receives the Holy Spirit, they won't think they got something other than what's in Judea, that was in, in Jerusalem. And so now the factions remain. But what is the purpose of Jesus Christ through his church? It's to make one new man, man out of all men. You understand that? The Bible says when we get to heaven, there will be what? There will be every nation, every tongue, every language. He's making one, one church, not several thousand churches. And that's the problem with America today. The reason why you got a black church now. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's because you think it's, it's, it's a different church. And we not allowing, you ain't allowing us as church. And that's the reason why you got a black church now. And the right Sunday morning is the most segregated time in, in all of America. And it's sad because right here, Jesus, God Himself, held back His Spirit to make sure that there was no fractions in His church. But look at all the fractions we've got today. You understand what I'm saying? Right, my family. My time is my time is up. But from this, from this, we have we have the teachings of. Confirmation. We have the teachings of apostles, bishops, and listen to it. That's the reason why the apostle has to come down and, and elevation services. Jesus. Right? But, but according to scripture, there are no more apostles. Right? This is the reason why, and, and forgive me for saying this, and I hope you don't get offended. I'm, I'm just teaching the black for the truth. This is the reason why in the Catholic Church they talk about the perpetual uh, office of Peter. Because you've got to use that. You have to come up with something in order to say, why is it that, that you can't receive something until I lay my hands on you? So they talk about the perpetual office of Peter. That the Pope carries the perpetual office, the, the, the Pope see of Peter. That's false teaching, man. No, the Bible says in order for somebody to be an apostle, they have to have done what? Walk with Jesus, sing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And perform miracles. That was it. That was the criteria that we saw in the Bible. Right? And so what do I have to do? What I need to do is convince all you Negroes that I got something you ain't got. <laughs> that you need my hand in order, for, in order for you to have something. But baby, let me tell you something. You got to get to God. I got to get to God the same way you do. And you ain't got no business unless, of course, you feel so guided by the Holy Spirit confessing your sins to me or coming to me saying, Pastor, pray for me. No, I can, I'm going to pray for you. We won't pray together. But you pray for yourself. Because you know who you sound like when you say that? You sound like Simon. What did Simon say? Pray for me. No, bro, pray for yourself. Because the same God that I call upon, you got the same access as a believer. He hears your pastor like he hears mine. So don't put Kepa on no pedestal. You hear me what I'm saying? No, you respect me, bro. Respect me, respect me. No, 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 no. I'm my little boy. I don't know. You know, respect me. But don't put me on no undue pedestal. Amen? Amen? No, I'm just talking about, I was walking in, uh, and I, you know, you know, you know, these, us, uh, us 2019 young pastors, you know, we like to be, we like to wear certain things. You know, I had my clergy collar on the other day, you know. <laughs> I, I walked in Walmart with my clergy collar on. Lord, that person, this is getting me like, Father, Father. <laughs> no, sister, no, I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Y'all receive the word on tonight. We'll pick back up on number three next week. Amen. Y'all receive the word tonight. Amen. Lord, we tell you. Amen. Amen. We tell you thank you for your word now, Lord God. Lord, we pray that we be not only hearers of the word, but doers also, Lord God. Amen. And now, Father God, as we go into our business meeting on tonight, I pray that you will bless our time together. Bless us, O God, as we talk about the business of the church. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We ask that if you are visiting with us on tonight, if you're visiting with us on tonight, we're going into our church. Jesus, we